they're going on Twitter, especially black tech Twitter, and they're seeing these people in all this luxury stuff, right? And they're saying, oh, I make $500,000 a year. You're not making $500,000 a year from one job. Like, let's be honest, unless you are contracting, and I mean C2C, corp to corp, or you have government contracts, or you're an entrepreneur, you're not making that type of money from a W-2 like that. It's very seldom you're seeing stuff like that. So as people are consistently coming online and saying those things, they're painting a false narrative for these newer people. And these newer people are feeling like they're so far behind, they have to catch up, and they're getting desperate. They're now spending money in the wrong places. They're looking at the wrong resources. There are only a, a certain amount of people that had the experience to make families in the twos or even close to the threes. Oh, why? Do you hear yeah. that? This video is being sponsored by Level Up in Tech. Are you interested in starting a career in cloud computing? The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that between 2021 and 2031, cloud computing jobs will increase by 15%. LinkedIn is also showing 170K plus roles related to the cloud that are currently open now. Also, the average cloud engineer salary is 132,000. Now you may be sitting there asking yourself, hmm, I wanna make $132,000. How do I get into the cloud? Well. Level Open Tech has got you covered. Level Open Tech is a 24 week comprehensive program dedicated to helping you land a cloud role. It will show you everything you need to know related to the cloud. They also have coaches that can guide you and ways on how to help you interview better. Level Open Tech has helped many people start their cloud career and they have so many testimonials on their website. Right now, Level Open Tech has a triple guarantee in place by the end of November, so you don't want to miss out. So, if you're interested in starting your cloud career, use my link that'll be in the description. Oh, you got to go to Thanksgiving. Uh, I was busy. Elaine hit me up a couple of weeks ago. She's like, yo, if you want to come, let me know. I was like, I got some stuff going on. So, I said, I probably will not be able to make it. Next year, I'm, I'm going to make it to that one for sure. I feel like you have to kind of plan in advance to be at it because it is over a couple of days. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. That and, I don't know, that actually would be... So one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about doing, and the listeners, all these people have been on the show already, but uh, I hit up Dayspring. I don't know if you're familiar with Dayspring. My guy Dayspring, and also my guy Tavion. And then we're going to probably bring one person, either my boy E or somebody else, and we're thinking about doing like a live show. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah, so it's going to be like live podcast type of Q&A. We might have like meet and greet, something like that to see what that the fans, that they want to. That would be dope because I don't think I saw anything like that. Right. And from the, for what we were doing in the industry, like for me, I'm real big on getting people that's actually doing something in the industry or been at it for a while. They got different experience. Everybody got multiple of different experience in actual different niche areas like in cyber. So that's exactly why it makes it interesting because most of us have different experiences. But like I said, two of the people up there I've worked with and then everybody's been on that saying they like they're different paths. So Right. No. Yeah, it was it was great. I mean, I was only able to attend the last day of Thanksgiving, which was on Friday, December 8th. But at that event, I was actually able to pre-launch um, a Pathways program I've been working on with one of my business partners, Amanda Reed. Um, she owns Woman Tech IT Consulting Group. And we got together and we decided to develop a, a Pathways program called Achieve It pathways program and it's really helps um, individuals who are looking to transition into tech who have zero experience they'll be able to get that hands-on experience they'll learn from um, experts and SMEs within the industry they'll take some certification um, courses and get some certifications and then the biggest part is the career development I find that a lot of programs are not doing career development it's pretty much where I come in because, you know, my company, You Deserve IT Consulting, career services firm. And so we focus a lot on really helping people to develop their skill sets and translate that right onto their resume and in their interviews. And so it has a big piece of that component. And so, yeah, we pre-launched at Thanksgiving and um, we kind of have a wait list going on right now. So that was very exciting. So we were very honored to be asked to be vendors there. And it was a great event. Cool. So before we get into more on the pod, is that program, is it regional based or can you be anywhere in the U.S. or how does it work? Yeah, great question. You can be anywhere in the U.S. It is 100 percent virtual. Got it. Got it. 
Welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. Well, I'm your host, HD. This is episode 111, and we have a great guest for you guys today. Her name is Markeisha. She is in cybersecurity. She also has a coaching. I don't even want to just consider it as coaching. She does a lot of different things with her company. So we're going to say she has a company, You Deserve IT. And she's came to rock with us today. But before we get more into the episode, if you're watching us on YouTube, you know what to do. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, hit the bell icon to be notified when I'm dropping our videos. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any other streaming service, please follow the podcast, download it so you can tune into us when you draw to work because that's what we make this good content for. But I'm glad she's she's came all the way from D.C. to, to rock with us today. So the first guest to, to just pull up on us from far away, so I really do appreciate that. We had a little bit of traffic influx this morning <laughs> down here in Dallas. They doing, I was making a joke. I'm like, nobody said I do the Boston Marathon today. <laughs> but real deal, y'all, like, I'm driving all the way around. GPS is so stupid, it doesn't realize, hey, they got an event going on. Were you using Waze? No. Oh, you are using Google Maps? No, I was using Apple. Oh, okay, yeah. But I think all of them would have still not known, because they only kind of recognize if, like, it's an accident or something. Like, because you know, you know, the highway, so it was an accident, so-and-so, reroute here. So I was like, bro, this is killing me. The crazy thing was, the way I came, I was going that way earlier, but... Got off on the side thinking I could do that, but then no streets were closed. I had to loop oh back around gosh. again, again, and then come all the way down just to get off right there. I was like, this is, this <laughs> that is, is the worst. I was like, I'm definitely not a Dallas person. but <laughs> You're definitely not a Dallas person? Nah, I ain't born here. <laughs> Listen, so yesterday I actually um, was sitting in a lot of traffic with the Uber um, driver. It took an hour just to get to my hotel, and my hotel's downtown. Shouldn't have taken that long. But back to back accidents. Mm-hmm. People can't drive down here. I heard people cannot drive in Dallas. All right, if you had to, hey, listen, we gonna have, we gonna have fun with this. If you was to guess the race of people who had accidents, who you think they is? Oh gosh, mm, the race is it more Hispanics? Yeah, but they can drive though. They can. So usually I'd say like Asians, but I don't. Is it Asians that are in? Kind of, but we talked about them with as them being recruiters. <laughs> we just leave like that. If you can know, if you in IT, you get what we're gonna say. That's what we're gonna say. They are recruiters and, and they can't drive. They be doing all type of stuff. <laughs> I'd be like, bro, or like people, like real deal. People just don't know how to like. Shout out to Pat. Pat was like, I would never understand why people don't know how to drive straight. Because I, for the life of me, I don't understand how you have a wreck on the highway. Because you're literally driving Same. straight. You're just driving straight. It must be when they're switching lanes. It's switching lanes. It's them. I'm going to tell you what also is getting people in trouble. They're relying too much on the technology instead of them. The blind spot. The, thing, the, the sensors are off sometimes. Mm-hmm. And they can't, they can't pick up. They're not as fast as a human like I like. You trust your instincts you've been driving for a while because sometimes you'll drive and they'll be like, do, 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 but nothing's by you or come right up on you. Or right. it's like you're departing the lane, but you're in lane. Like, it's, it's stupid. So just don't rely on that. That's very true. How, so outside of the traffic, how you been enjoying Dallas? Great. I was actually at the mall yesterday. Okay, which is at North Park Mall? Yes, I was over there. And it is nice, I will say. Yeah, this funny thing is like, I tell people all the time, when people talk about like Houston, Austin, Dallas, I was like, well... If you want the best of both worlds, you want to have, like, stuff to do, and then you want something that's going to actually, like, be a little city down here in Texas, like, move to Dallas, mm. especially for us. I don't, like, Austin is cool. They got some tech jobs down there. Their downtown is cool. It's a little bit more liberal laid back. For me, I feel like it's, it's, it's for more of a younger crowd. Yeah. I feel like I feel like Dallas is the best of both worlds. Because even, like, Houston is, like, good. Like, food, partying, you want to have fun. I hear a lot about Houston. I mean, I have to go to Houston next. Houston, Houston you're going to have a good time, especially with uh, the strippers liking you. You're going to have a good time. <laughs> the strippers. Yeah, I actually just me. put on Twitter, I was like, yo, is strip club food good? Because I'm not a strip club type of guy. The strip club food can be good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like I'm not really like a strip club kind of guy. So I tend to not order strip club food when I go because a lot of the times it's like finger foods, like wings and stuff, and I'm not eating wings at a strip club, especially when I'm about to be touching strippers. So yeah, I want to get well. Some people like the athletes, I listen to something like like the pods or the the entertainers. They'll go there like certain strip clubs with like certain food that like everybody knows about. Like really good food. Yeah. Tank is always talking about some impossible burger at some strip club. <laughs> I forgot where it is, but I don't know. And then uh, B. Marsh would talk about uh, whatever club. He was, like, going there, like, steak or something. I don't know. But I, I want to try, like, 
the only club I've been out to here is um it wasn't ecstasy. I think it's closed down now. It was smaller. It's a smaller version of what they had they had in Houston. I think that one was closed down too. It's a uh, freaking I forgot. I it'll, I'll come it'll come to me uh, next. No, time. I was telling somebody on Twitter that I needed to go to a strip club, but I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. But I'll come back. I'll come back to Dallas so I can check it out. Yeah, we might have an event, but let's introduce you to to the the viewers, the listeners. Who is yeah. Markeisha? Yeah, so my name is Markeisha Snaith. Um, born and raised in the Alexandria, Virginia area. Um, currently living in Maryland, which I actually prefer living in Maryland over living in Northern Virginia again, just because the prices are very, um, you know, high up there, but also traffic. It's, it's hectic. I mean, ever since I was born, there's just been construction all the time. It's, it's never changed. Um, but yeah, living in Maryland, um, I am the CEO and owner of You Deserve IT Consulting, but I do also have a lot of other businesses and I have things coming down the pipeline, especially at the start of next year that I'm really excited to um, share with people um, in the near future. So thank you for having me on uh-huh. here. Thank you for coming. We've been trying to do this for a while. That's a funny thing. We have, thing. and we weren't even going to do it in person. Right, right. I was just like, I've been, because you know what's funny? At first, I hesitated on asking people, was like, did they want to come out here? But then I thought about it. I was like, it's not Miami, it's not LA, but people be wanting to come to Dallas. Absolutely. So when I, when I say that, I say, when are you coming down? It was like, shoot, just let me know. So I appreciate you for coming down. I've kind of been off the pod for like a couple of weeks. That This coming week, they may or may not get some because I'm, I'm busy, but if stuff go through like it's supposed to, it'll be worth it. Absolutely. But I want to get briefly into like your, your background about high school. Well, a little bit of high school, but more so like college kind of, did you know that you want to be in tech? Did you want to do something else? Like a lot of people, a lot of people didn't know they want to be like in tech or IT or cybersecurity or whatever. A lot of people thought they was going to do something else. I thought I was going to be an architect. Well, no, before I thought I was going to be an architect, I thought I was going to be a professional wrestler. Then I thought I was going to be an architect. Oh, okay. I mean, those are good career paths though, right? Yeah, but think about it. I didn't really, well, back then they had some of the shows on TV about being a wrestler tough enough. But then I was going to say, okay, cool. I got to go to wrestling school, fall school, do all this and that. Then nine times out of ten, to be a good wrestler, I probably going to have to get on steroids. <laughs> um, the promos was good. I was raised up on Stone Cold and The Rock and Triple H, Shawn Michaels. All the all the greats, that's what I watched like every day. So I think it would have been fun. Like a couple, part of me still wants to like, I don't know. I like to cut some promo. I actually be want to do like the back and forth a little bit with podcasts and content with the other podcasters sometimes just to give them, you know, a little COE. But about you, like what, what were you interested in kind of like in your, your younger adolescent years? Sure. So I think it's always a great conversation starter, especially when I'm in interviews. So my bachelor's degree is in theology and theology is the study of God. Um, I didn't originally start off like that. Um, my focus was really on healthcare. Uh, growing up, like at the age of 12, I wanted to um, move into like forensics and then um, ended up really be interested. I really ended up being interested in moving into doing surgery. So like being a neurosurgeon or a general surgeon in the ER. Um, that was of interest to me because at that time, Uh, My mom had just found out that she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And um, in my mind, I really wanted to help her, right? And so um, taking a path like that, you know, moving into medicine would have allowed me to be able to do so. So the healthcare track was where I was headed. And so when I first started off in college, um, I started off at Old Dominion University. I was there for two years. That's in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I was on the biology track and things were going really, really, really great there. Um, but I decided that I need to be home because my mom got really sick. She got much, much, much more sick. And so I, um, transferred over to Loyola University, Maryland, which is in, um, Baltimore, Maryland. It was the first Loyola actually Jesuit school. And that's really what led me over to Loyola was the Jesuit education. It is, um, a unique Um, I guess you could say perspective um, that the Jesuits have. They really focus on the whole individual. Um, And that was important to me. So when I started off at Loyola, 
things were a little different for me. The school environment, you know, a lot of the students came from up north and they were very clicky already because they had all been going to private schools for high school. And it was different, you know, it wasn't very diverse. But fortunately, I ended up um, becoming best friends with my college roommate at Loyola. So it was great. And so I was taking biology and I just honestly could not pass chemistry. I mean, I had taken chemistry maybe like three different times. And at that time, my uncle was just starting his college um, and he was pursuing medicine, which now he's actually a doctor. So I'm super proud of him. He stuck through it. He's a smart one. But um, <laughs> tech, um, uh, chemistry was not my thing. And so no matter, I took, I went to, um, I had tutors, I went to summer school, I was not able to pass chemistry. And I had spoken to my professor and he, he had asked, you know, is, is this truly what you want to do? Or have you considered something else? And because starting at Loyola, you had to take the core courses and it being a Jesuit school, theology were some of the core courses I had to take. And so I started going down that path of theology and you know, Loyola offered very unique courses like demonology and hell versus heaven. And you can imagine that stuff is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So I ended up going that track and switching over. And I'm happy I did because, you know, a degree in humanities is, in my opinion, a very strong degree. It really helps you to, you know, know how to like read, write, but really those analytical skills, which you use in tech now, right? And so, um, just dabbling kind of in the jobs that I had between healthcare and doing a lot of being able to do like a lot of tech stuff there at those companies. Um, I ended up kind of officially making my way into tech. Um, and fast forward, um, I was kind of moving into cybersecurity. I had done um, SharePoint development stuff. So I actually had no idea what I was doing with SharePoint development. But I had somehow gotten into a contract and one of the departments I had to move into, they needed somebody to develop the SharePoint. And it was like I had three days to learn off somebody and I learned it. And then I started doing it for all of the directives. And that's kind of how I landed on SharePoint development. And from there, I kind of just kept maneuvering my way. And, you know, now I'm doing more security architect work. Cool. We'll get into that. I had a couple of jokes about theology. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you, were you, did you ever think about going to be a missionary? Yes, I could see you. Being I a did missionary. actually think All about black that the thing on. Right, I, I, could see you going over there. <laughs> I was like, because because you always see like, and I think the, that's the thing. I think theology is interesting. I, uh, I do listen to people their perspectives on different things. Or oh, I studied here, I studied here, and unfortunately, the the interesting thing about you know, religion is that I think two things could be the same, but then you got to think about, okay, who exactly wrote all this that we're learning, where did it come from? And then what they believe, what they believe, what they believe. That's like why people just argue, people start fighting. That's why wars and, and stuff happen most of the time, a lot of like in the past or like over religion. So oh, I think, absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's a pretty interesting. And then you will just have, I don't know. I, th I think it's, I think it's just cool. I think then when you do like go into theology, you'll see how many people never read their Bible at all. That is true. <laughs> and a lot of my classmates, you know, they already had a Catholic background because they were going to the private schools. And so it was different to hear their perspective. Um, I mean, I had always, you know, been Christian, but it was really important for me to understand what Christianity was. Why was I Christian? Because most of the times we are what our parents are, right? Mm -hmm. And so if our parents are going to church, we're going to church. But do we really understand why we're going to church? And I think it's important for people to explore that. And I had an opportunity to do so. Yeah. And this is not a religious podcast at all. But from, from my <laughs> can make it. <laughs> from my experience, what tends to happen in, in those ways is that a lot of times parents are just dragging the kids to church, but they're not explaining anything to them. And then their church probably is not really even teaching the kids at a young age certain things. They're probably just there in the back playing. Until, and coloring, yeah, yeah. Until they get to a certain age, and then the family is probably not doing any type of study on their own or teaching the kids or anything at all. Like, so I had the benefit. Like, I'm not even a frequent church goer now. I actually have my own kind of thoughts a little bit as far as you know, organized religion or all these other things. However, I did have the benefit of being a part of 
my church family were, of course, I was a drummer once I got older, but we were always in different plays, learning these different things, which things that still stick with me now, things right. that I know. I'm still able to, if I wanted to, like, debate people when they bring things up because I know what's scripture, I know what's not. <laughs> and so it's definitely it's definitely it's, it's definitely pretty cool like, it can get know. fun <laughs> yeah. i mean that, that's the the whole the whole premise about everything is like okay you'll have like the biggest thing is like okay well old testament was wrote more, mostly in hebrew then now you got greek translation and now it's different and well it's different in old this and that but you know god got a verse that he changes not but so if he changes not then he still don't like these people and that people like that's why a lot of I think a lot of people feel like it's a book of contradictions. Mm-hmm. So that's why people are like this in this other way. It's just, it's just a lot when you kind of just break it down, and that's why people are just like, man, I don't know. Like it, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people they don't break it down, right? So you know, just kind of going back to what you said, where you know a lot of parents just drag their kids along to church and whatnot, and then kind of what the church is teaching, which maybe they're not really spending time teaching how they should or what they should um, it's important to kind of do that on your own and to really understand the bible and break it down like when I was in my studies we would I mean we would spend an entire semester going over one book in Mm -hmm. um, the bible and it was a lot I mean I had to write like 30 page papers on genesis and I mean, mm. that's overwhelming, See, right? But that's, <laughs> I'm telling you, all that stuff is interesting, but it's kind of hard. The reason why I probably can do theology, because if they want to really get to the nitty gritty, I really be, would break down Genesis, and I'm like, first of all, none of y'all in here are like them people. Now, I look similar to them, but y'all don't. <laughs> that's what's something I would, I would tell them, because it just makes sense. If you talk about the landscape, where it's supposed to take place, and all these different things, we know how genetics work. It definitely wasn't them back then. Right. But... I'll say this, and then we'll get to the next question. Talking about going to church and religion, similar to college, it's kind of what you get. What you get what you put into it. It's mm-hmm. like I was telling my younger brother, "Hey, you're in school now, but you're gonna have to do learning outside of school, yeah, in order to get to where you want to get to. If you want to get an internship, all this other stuff they're teaching you is like fine. You're really going there to connect with people and network, but you got to put in your own work outside of school in order to be successful. You really have to apply yourself, and I think that goes hand in hand with. IT field, Mm -hmm. right? You always have to consistently be learning. Um, You can't just sit back and get into a job and kind of just feel like you can coast. It doesn't work that way. You have to apply yourself. You have to always level up your skills. And I mean, I know we'll get into that a lot more, but um, that's definitely something important to note. Definitely. Now, earlier you talked about how you just got your break doing SharePoint development. But some of my listeners may not even know what SharePoint is. So in layman's terms, could you explain what SharePoint is? Sure. Let me see the best way I can break this down. Um, And then to be clear, it wasn't just technically getting a break doing SharePoint development. I had always been doing IT work. So there was a point in time when I was an office manager and I still had to like manage all of the IT, like the onboarding of all of like the um, laptops and I had to configure them and the phone system and stuff like that. So I was able to kind of get, you know, um, a lot more experience that way, but kind of going back to SharePoint and what it is. So SharePoint um, is a site that um, is through Microsoft, so Microsoft um, SharePoint. And it's pretty much, let me see, the best way to say this is SharePoint is a site that can be used for, it's almost like confluence in a sense, I guess Mm -hmm. you could say. So you you can make websites on it, but then you can also store a lot of your documentation and your files and whatnot. Um, so at that time, I had to develop a lot of the directorates pages. Um, so working for the government, there was multiple um, directorates, and there was like nine under where I was the agency I was working for. And I had to develop each page. So people basically had a landing page to go to. So if they needed to, and this was actually external so if they needed to read more up on the directorate they would go to that page and then click in read more about the organization if they needed to upload information they'd be able they'd be able to upload it if they needed to um be able to kind of um pull some information down they were able to do that so 
it was very overwhelming in a sense that I had no clue what I was doing and I was always having to make it work for my clients because I was a contractor. Um, but I was able, I mean, over time to like navigate and kind of work between the old SharePoint and the new SharePoint development. That's nice. Yeah, I would say it's close to like a simpler term probably to get them to understand it's like an internal directory maybe. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Because normally if you log onto like your home screen, it's going to go to your internal directory telling you what's going on in your company, what's happening, how to go to these different things. If you need to search for something, hey, how do I submit for time off or all that type of stuff? Yeah, yeah, that. definitely. It can be very, again, again, very informative. So it can be like internal, which um, they use it internally, but they also use it externally as well. So your story reminds me of a post that my guy sent me on LinkedIn. Um what was it, like last night? And it kind of reminds me, I think of why when it comes to tech Twitter and everything else, well, sometimes there is a disconnect between people who've been in 5, 10, 15 years and newer people trying to get in. When we were getting in, there was none of the content that's out now. We just knew people did it and we wanted to. So mm -hmm. it was different and we knew that it was rare for us to see somebody not start from the bottom and just go straight to the top. Right. And a lot of people now want to skip all that and go straight to the top. So I'm going to read this post and then we'll kind of talk about what it said. He said, I started out working in IT. I started on the help desk. I was also going to school in the evenings for Microsoft Systems Engineering. Within nine months, I passed the seven search to achieve the MCSE in Windows NT 4.0. This was 25 plus years ago. I also cooked at a bar after my computer classes. I had to pay the bills. Once I got my MCSE, I got hired as a consultant. They sent me out to customers to set up, configure, troubleshoot, etc. Their server issues. I was dropped into situations that I had no idea about. I had to figure it out on the fly. I had to read Microsoft manuals, Cisco manuals. We didn't have the Google. I was sent out to install new Cisco routers. I had zero experience with Cisco. So I bought a lot of Cisco manuals and I figured it out. I got them up and running. I feel as if today we are giving the folks jobs without truly putting their feet to the fire. I can certainly train someone, but if they have to have figure it out, that is a big plus. That is a skill that is hard to define. We must test our applicants for aptitude. Aptitude is why I could eventually figure it out. Aptitude is what we need to look for in candidates. Look for evidence that they took a technical issue and figured it out. Look for evidence that they faced with a potential security issue and dissected it. All those who say you can break, bring on entry folks into cyber are missing this point. We are responsible for some very serious issues. We are responsible for preventing a risk that could cost the organization a million of dollars. We can't just hire someone to give them a break. We need to hire those who have demonstrated that passion, who can be cool under pressure. Is that intern ready to do that? Do they have the experience to handle the pressure under the fire? Find folks who have lived that and who have that amazing aptitude. I think there's a lot to what I said can break down. It is. I think he did get his break and he didn't know anything and he figured it out. So that's good. But I do also agree with him. Like I said, people want to break in now, but we don't know how to test their aptitude because a lot of times people just did a lot of stuff online. They've never just worked in an actual setting and figured anything out. Like so many people write on help desk or knock or whatever into the role you want to do. But one thing you can say in that interview is like, Hey, this new thing happened and I figured it out. I remember like it's yesterday of I was working for the TSA help desk. This is early on in my career. At first, we just used to service all the TSA screeners, people that work at all the airports. So all those important people that's at the airports, we used to support them. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, it's like, these are the people that's trying to keep us safe <laughs> when we have to deal with them <laughs> on the phone. But needless to say, after that, we started supporting the federal air marshals. So, for people that don't know who FAMs are, they're the people that are riding the plane with you, but they're in plain clothes with their officers to make sure nothing happens when you're on the plane. Mm -hmm. And it's imperative back then, these guys, this is how long I've been in the game. Back then, they were using Blackberries. Oh, yeah. And we was using, um, I think it was called Bez, Blackberry Enterprise. Well, we had no documentation on them. They just said, they flipped the switch and said, hey, y'all covering them. So we're on the phone trying to figure out how, we don't even know what they're trying to do looks like. And so these are where you get those skills at where when it comes to like now, if I want to work on a project or a product, I know different questions to ask because I've been through like trying to solve solutions because what I'm trying to help him with is critical. He needs right. his phone for internet. We need to figure it out. So this involves me, hey, looping, calling my manager on the weekend and saying, hey, listen, I don't know what they're looking, looking at. 
let's figure out these questions so we can ask them and figure these things out. I was able to help make documentation for that. But that's a situation where, hey, I have think about it. You have no idea what you're looking at and you want to help them out. And they're getting frustrated. You get frustrated. It's like, listen, they just told us to help y'all. We don't even know how to help you guys. We have no <laughs> documentation, which was really bad on their part because it could have went bad. But our team figured it out. There are people, you've been doing this, I've been doing this for a while. I, I talk to these people in these different consultations. Some of them I know right away that they've been doing a lot of good things and they can figure something out and they'll be good at a company. Matter of fact, shout out to one of my clients. He started his role like either last week or this week. He could, he got thrown straight into the fire. He met, he thought he messed something up, but he didn't. But it was on the company because they didn't have documentation right, nor did they tell him how to do it the right way. <laughs> and then he was just showing me the screenshots. And afterwards, the guy said, like, yeah, we'll just we'll walk through it or whatever. But – now, in today's time, they will try to make somebody feel bad. My client went from 50K to 78K. For anybody else, that's a good come up. Right. If you say that on Twitter, somebody's going to try to say, are oh, you broke? 70 some K? But I was like, we know the median earnings in the country is probably like 40,000, 50,000, maybe in a household with two people working, maybe 80. Right. <laughs> and so somebody will try to like down somebody like that because they do think everybody is in a, what's that you the other day? Matter of fact, I bookmarked some of your tweets. Oh gosh. <laughs> I bookmarked some of your tweets so we can talk about I it. say but some crazy things. Yeah, you do. Um, I think the biggest thing here too is the pandemic has changed a lot of things, right? So I feel, you know, as you talk about kind of how we made our way into tech and we kind of did it like in a traditional type of way. And now since the pandemic, you know, everybody pretty much went remote during that time. There was no other option there and things had to keep moving. And so people were able to land multiple roles and work those multiple roles, which by the way, that is a blessing. That is not something that everybody in every single industry is able to do. And I think that sometimes people forget that um, and they kind of don't remember where they started. And so as they're sitting there saying, wow, 75,000 isn't a lot. And, you know, you need to be making over 200,000. That's not everybody. A lot of people are making that money because they're working more than one job. And I think people forget that. And they paint this false narrative and picture for other people on let's use Twitter as an example. And now everybody's feeling like, Oh my God, I need to do all this stuff to reach that point. But again, you don't know what these people are really doing behind closed doors. Like you and I, you know, we've been introduced to other people. We kind of, we, we really know what people are doing. We may not say it, but we know whereas a newer person is coming on, they're going on Twitter especially black tech Twitter, and they're seeing these people in all this luxury stuff, right? And they're saying, oh, I make $500,000 a year. You're not making $500,000 a year from one job. Like, let's be honest, unless you are contracting, and I mean C2C, corp to corp, or you have government contracts, or you're an entrepreneur, you're not making that type of money from a W-2 like that. It's very seldom you're seeing stuff like that. So as people are consistently coming online and saying those things, they're painting a false narrative for these newer people. And these newer people are feeling like they're so far behind, they have to catch up, and they're getting desperate. They're now spending money in the wrong places. They're looking at the wrong resources. Yeah, I agree. There are only a, a certain amount of people that have <clears throat> that had the experience to make salaries in the twos or even close to the threes. And I know some of them and they've been doing it a while. So a while. You hear their, that? Their it's their not like two comp, years. Yeah. And then if they haven't been doing as long, which I know some people have, haven't been doing it as long, like they probably have less than five years experience, their skills are elite. So I always tell people, if you do want elite pay, you need elite skills. You know? Absolutely. The like she said, 2020, 2021, they were over hiring. That's why a lot of these people got laid off. And so people were like, ah, oh, what's going on with tech? Uh huh. No, they just over hired. A lot of companies, I did an episode where I was talking about Meta's over hiring. Mm -hmm. They just hired a lot of people because they didn't want them to go work for the other fan companies. Exactly. So people <laughs> were there just not doing anything. That's why you got the influx of the day in the life. Oh, today I just went and got my coffee. I got a spa. Yeah, the day in the Got lives. my feet done and all that. That's why people want to do it. Oh, cool. She's getting paid 200000 and just doing that. That's why. That's why 
even if I start making like a lot of money, it probably would never be luxury content because for one, I'm just like a simple guy, I'm a family man with kids and stuff. But two, I want people to look at what I'm talking about content wise and what I'm putting out there so they can look towards that versus trying to attain stuff that I can attain because of my likeness, because of what mm-hmm. I put in and my own personal thing. So a lot of us now who have personalities or we have a presence on social media, we get offer different things that you guys can't get so i can like i make content now so i get brands reaching out to me to want to do segments on my channel or affiliate deals where i can just promote a product and get paid some money every month that you know that's i mean hey it is what it is but i put in the work to get there right so like you said there are people that do like different things that's done that and then a lot of those people are forthcoming with that information they say hey i make all this from like my job, and now when it comes to brand deals, hey, I'm making, you know, 50000 40000 a month from brand right. deals. So those people are actually being honest and with you. And you have to respect those people. It's called transparency, and it's it's always a lovely thing when people are transparent. And I understand maybe not being able to put everything out there, but you really, if you want to follow people, you need to follow genuine people. You need to be able to understand if people are being honest or if they're being fake or, like, withholding information. Definitely, definitely. And then one of your tweets I brought up was... Oh, gosh. That's not bad. It was... This was... <laughs> I think it was, like, last year. It was, like, if you make 100K, you're in the top 3% of earners. I don't know if it's top three. That was actually from a survey. Oh, really? It was. Okay. Man, but the reason why I said that is because we know everybody's not in the top 3%. That is very true. I come from a city where probably the, the median income might be twenty or $30,000. Yeah, I think the median for where I'm living currently is maybe, I think, for an individual is about 50000 or 60000 if I'm not mistaken, and then combined about 95000 mm-hmm. But I think the real issue is the fact that inflation has gotten out of control. Oh, my gosh. So you have no choice but to do what you have to do to survive. Exactly. And if that means doubling up, tripling up, I mean, going on your hustle, getting multiple side jobs, like, I get it. You have to do what you have to do to be able to put food on the table. Exactly. They did a, it was this TikTok I saw, and the guy, it's a guy I follow, he always breaks down boomers' theories about, oh, they are lazy or they're not, they don't want to buy a house or they want to stay with mom. He's like, no, a lot of these people can't afford to move out. They did a, so Home Alone, if people have never seen Home Alone, Kevin went to the store and used twenty dollars to buy like laundry detergent, some crackers, some some other crap he bought. So they did the same thing for they showed if he would have went to the store in twenty twenty two, that same stuff would have been like forty four dollars. Then they said if you went in twenty twenty three, the same stuff a year ago that was forty four dollars was like seventy something. It's crazy. And so this is the same one. I'm gonna tell y'all to always look out for yourself. Your jobs every year are not giving most people raises that are beating inflation. They're not. But yet, they will want you to stay there with a family, be loyal, and all this other stuff to us. But it's like, hey, I'm having a hard time feeding my family, and you want me to stay here? So I'm going to just tell you, do with the information as you may. Exactly. And move accordingly. That's what I'm going to tell you to do. Yep. And we're going to leave it there. (laughs) Right. So talk about, like I said, I read your bio. You know, I gave you the questions. And one of the questions was about, you got a chance to go ahead, and I believe, participate in this cybersecurity class and where you kind of opened your mind up to something that cyber you didn't know about? Yeah. So I actually um, had a friend who was teaching um, RMF. So risk management framework for you all that don't know. So it falls under governance, risk and compliance. So really understanding um, the regulations and the security controls that go into being able to uh, protect our data or protect our information, our systems, et cetera. Um, so I was able to sit in on a class. Um, the class was for about six weeks and ended up extending into eight weeks. And I just really wanted to get an idea of kind of like what RMF was and to kind of see, you know, how he taught and what it consisted of. Because I had really had no understanding of what like a boot camp or like what these courses were, right? Because six weeks to eight weeks is almost, that's like nothing, right? Um, very accelerated. So sat in on the class class came to an end and the next steps were to start applying for jobs so it's like take your resume put it out there and start getting interviews um so he had given you know people like 
a few examples of resumes and said, hey, this is how an appropriate resume looks. Take this, you know, tailor your resume to what you're looking for. Put the class on it that you took the class for six to eight weeks and then just start putting it out there. Well, majority of the class couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, I was like one of out of five people that were able to take the like take my resume, put it out there and specifically like look for like a compliance role. Um, and of course, you know, when I put it out there, it was great. And I say, of course, because I've always been good at writing. That's always been my thing. And I really um, I really value that skill set that I have. But um, I was able to put my resume out there, got job interviews, landed roles. And when I looked back at some of the other students who were completely lost, I felt so bad for them because I said, there's a disconnect here. So you take this course that you paid money for, but you're not getting the job. And the whole point of taking a course is to really get a job. If you didn't have to take a course and you could just start applying and figure it all out, people would do that, right? Right. And so that's actually how my company was born out of that. You know, it's actually going on four years now. But, um, you know, it was I saw that people needed someone to help them get to the finish line. And I wanted to be that person. I really started off just doing resumes. Then I slowly began to do interview preparation. Then it moved into, you know, LinkedIn optimization. And now I'm here today where I'm a career coach and I'm really helping people smoothly make that transition and it's not just people looking to get into tech I mean a lot of my clients come from different fields as well but it's just majority is are those that are looking to get into tech yeah for sure I think that's what I one of the things I realized too I started this in, in 2020 and I realized a lot of the different things that are going out there especially and I everything I did based off of was like off of my own career what I realized mm-hmm. and how could I like help people right or people are getting like all these different things there. Some people are telling them to get stuff that doesn't even go with what they want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I quickly noticed that, or it's just the mental games. I had a consultation Thursday night with a guy and he started telling me what he was doing at work as a, let's see, I think he's doing like IT support. He started telling me what he was doing. Oh yeah. I provision users. I decommission them. I give him this access, this access. Also. So I stopped him and said, so you do identity access management. He was like, what? I'm not familiar with the term. I said, I know you're not familiar with the term. They not going to tell you that's what you're doing at work because they don't want you to go get paid more. Exactly. Because if you stay with support on your resume, that's the only type of job you're going to get. And that's why I tell people, hey, do support six months a year, leave, but learn some stuff there. Mm-hmm. Take advantage. That's that's like one of the things they run into. But funny enough that you talked about they're, they're taking the courses, but they can't get a job and you're getting a whole bunch of other bad advice. Like for me, I would have told people in that situation for the class you guys took, hey, this needs to be labeled more of a a really in detail project Mm -hmm. that you can showcase what you know. Because a lot of people will go do all these different courses, Udemy or whatever, and then throw the skills on their resume. But I'm like, if you're trying to pivot, and I look at this, how am I just going to call you? Because you got these keywords on here. So it's why did you see, so I got a lot of, matter of fact, we're just going to laugh at it. Um, we're gonna we're gonna, this is a different pod. This is like the kind of pods I want to do because it's funny because we're in similar space. So I'm gonna play this for her, for y'all, and then you'll listen to it. Let's see where the video is. I'm gonna drop all the sauce in the video to how to get hired working from home. Like, say, follow, and take notes. Step one is creating a fire resume and including as many keywords in your document because a lot of these tech companies are using AI or an applicant tracking system to scan your actual PDF file and count up the number of keywords or relevant words to the actual job you're applying to. There's even some creative ways to include keywords on your section, but make them transparent. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but there's actually AI tools you can use to send out thousands of applications for you so you don't have to worry about it. Now you're going to have a really good LinkedIn profile too. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but I literally go step by step in all my free guides and in my free group on how to break into tech. And the last part is going to be recording your interviews and consistently getting better. Because pro athletes always watch their film after a game, so you have to watch your interview film after you interview. Now, if you do all those steps, you research the company, you come prepared with good questions, and you're confident, and you express how interested you are in actually working for that company, and then ask them what the next steps are, and if you can get that next interview or call on the calendar, I guarantee you're going to stand out than 90% of the other candidates who are trying to get the same job as you are. 
I made a video of me cold calling and a 25 minute video of how I broke into tech. All you have to do is DM me on Instagram, the word tech, and I will send it to you for the free. The only thing I agreed with was the record yourself interviewing and kind of express why you want to work at a company. But I went and checked this. Like, this is what I'll tell y'all. I went and checked <laughs> it. He had his LinkedIn on the video. So I went and looked at it. I said, oh, he a pup. He just got in. He don't know what he's talking about. Because anybody telling you to put words on a resume and make them transparent is really fooling you. Recruiters know. Any, that's not like some people say, oh, put the, put the font real small and make it white. That's going to get you an interview. No, it's not. <laughs> you can't just stuff keywords on your resume and think it's going to get you hired. I, I look at a lot of people with a word salad on their resumes all the time, and they can't get interviewed. Oh, my God. It's it's like overkill. Like, you know that they're literally just throwing the words on there. Like, they actually haven't done the work. Yeah. Their interview is not telling the story. So, most people say, hey, your interview needs to be guided to tell your story. I'm a person. Now, there are disagreements. Some people like summaries. I don't like summaries. If you got a lot of experience and you're trying to pivot, I would say, hey, let's do career highlights. We can get short and sweet to the point. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen some tips, too, to where a lot of people focus on trying to tailor every resume. But it's like you really can just tailor those like career highlight points. Yeah, absolutely. Versus like just trying to tailor the whole thing. And that way works. The way it works for me. Like so one of the things that I do with my clients, like while I'm interviewing or getting interviews with big companies, I'm showing them. Like the other day I was preparing for something. And I went and researched the company, see what kind of current news they had going on. I found a blog that was related to something current. And I read up on it in the case they asked me a question or something by similar scenario. I already mm -hmm. know about it. Right. And there's other ways I know about it that I, I will discuss off the camera. But needless to say, I'm a person that I'll show you if I do it, if it's good enough for me, it should be good enough for you. Mm -hmm. And then that gives them the hope to keep on following my advice because I'm showing them, hey, it works. Right. But... The bad thing is you can, this was people I think I've forgotten. You think because somebody's following is very big that what they're saying is true. There are only a couple of people who have a big following that actually tell, have like content where it's like right. And that, that percent is like very small. I agree. The other people, they are grifting. They are just, I'm, I'm, mad, I'm not mad at it, but you need to know the difference. I ain't really mad they doing it because they getting paid. He getting money on TikTok. I ain't mad at it. He doing what he got to do because he young. And he just got in tech sales like not too long ago. So it is what it is. But for you trying to follow that advice, that advice is not going to work for you. It possibly may work in tech sales, which tech sales is a non-technical role. It can pay a lot, but you got to do work to really make a lot of the money that people say that they're making. But it's not the, it's not the hardest type of role to get into. So that's the the benefit of it. If you did a lot of stuff, you come from retail or you was driving cars, it's cool. But technical jobs or either non-technical jobs that focus on transferable skills or you can actually show value on your resume, that's what you need to show. We just did a, and maybe you can come on the next one, we did a live resume review, me, oh, yeah. Erica, and uh, Tiara. And we had like 20 resumes, uh, 20 resumes we reviewed. And what I did was I either just – made their name a rapper or something, uh -huh. but I'm telling you, I've seen all type of resumes on there. We had somebody that had the pictures or the search they had at the top of the resume. Listen, it is so fun to tear apart resumes. And I mean, it's not like, it's not to be mean. It's just, it just, after a while, it just becomes like a thrill, at least to me. Cause I'm like, okay, this is wrong. And I'm like doing it so fast. Like the way I can just go through, I can immediately look at a resume, like a recruiter within seven five seven seconds and i know if it's good or not and that's what i tell people I say nobody got all the time to read all this stuff they don't get to the point point. and you know the picture things with the certifications that used to be a thing i will say it was a thing like in 2019 2020 people were putting that top of their resumes okay but now we're in 2023 going into 2024 you have to stay hip you have to know what works and what does not work i don't i really don't recall it being too much a thing, or at least for me, because I know those same things, those credentials are supposed to be on your LinkedIn anyway. Absolutely. So I always say have your LinkedIn a little bit more detailed in your resume because, I mean, people go view that all the time. I would also say, I can't even remember because it was just. And your LinkedIn should be, in my opinion, 
informal. So your resume should be more formal, but your LinkedIn, people should be able to go there and be able to see personality on there. Yeah. So don't forget that. Like you're not supposed to take everything that's on your resume and put it onto your LinkedIn. Now experience, okay, but you don't have to put every single bullet point but you really need to showcase your talent, your skills, your experience, how likable as a person yep. you are, how creative as a person you are on your LinkedIn, because that's where recruiters are going. That's where hiring managers are going. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. I can't. The people on the Patreon and, and my clients, they know. I can't say it because I never know who's watching these things. People mm -hmm. always be hating, like hating stuff for real. But no, that's true. Like I have a client. He just got a internship pen testing with um, a company with the guy. Actually, me and him follow each other on Twitter, and we was talking about my client. He was like, yeah, man, I like that. He posts all the stuff he's doing in his blog and all these pen testing activities and this and that. So I just like he's posting and doing this. He's showing me what mm -hmm. he's about. And that's one of the things I tell people, like, hey, if you're trying to pivot, you think applying to a 1,000 jobs is going to be so helpful for you, but it's not because – it's no way possible you're going to be able to prep for a 1,000 jobs. Number right. One. Number two, you're not even going to remember what jobs you applied to. That's going to be the hard part. Number three, it's much more easier to network and get people to notice you on the jobs you really want versus doing all that. And that's the things we go through. We go through, hey, this is how you go get a recruit. This is how you find somebody on the team. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. People are scared of networking. And yeah. honestly, that's like number one, in my opinion. You have to utilize the people around you to be able to get the job or whatever it is that you want. And if you can't utilize the people around you, then you don't have the right people around you. Like I can call up someone right now and I can go to, I can sit down with them and they will be able to introduce me to another individual who can help me. If you do not have that, you need to reevaluate your circle. Yeah. I think it's the same thing. We know the men, and I like to always correlate searching for a job with dating. We know the men that's successful with women is not. The men that's successful, if you aren't scared to talk to women, mm -hmm. you'll go up and, hey, you do you want to drink? How you doing? What's your name? Yada, yada, yada. Just do the same thing on LinkedIn. It's not hard. Like, the worst a girl can ever tell you is no. Just like the worst a job can do is just reject you. <laughs> if she say no, go on. It's, it's a whole bunch of other women out there. You, we see the type of men these women talk to, so. We see the type of people that get hired at these jobs. So don't be phased by it. Everybody not going to answer a message. It happens to me. Everybody don't answer me. Sometimes they don't see them. Like, right. They don't see it. Or they're just like, okay, connect. And that's it. Because like one of the people, and I work on this, this is also a key, right? If you want somebody to answer you, you have to work on being social first and just sometimes going straight to the message. But this depends if they post a lot. Yeah. So I've been able to get certain guests on my platform because, like, even before I ever reached out you, me and you have interacted plenty of times right. on the timeline. And that's how I reach out. So a lot of times, unless I just go to your page and I see, oh, you do something interesting in the bio, a lot of times I'm going to try to interact first and then say, hey, you know, uh, would you want to do an intro call? Let's talk about possibly be on the pod. But for bigger creators that you're probably interested in or people on LinkedIn, Interact with them on a on a platform. A lot of stuff. Comment. Yeah, comment. Know who's gonna be on like there. their blogs. Start a conversation. Hey, I recently came across your your post. Um, you know, I can really relate to this. I wanted to talk to you a lot more. You know, are you free? Things like that. Like you have to be likable. Uh, you can't be afraid of rejection. You're not going to get anywhere if you are consistently living in fear. Yeah, and an underrated thing you guys are not doing. You're not putting notes in your connection requests. I have over a thousand connection requests on LinkedIn. I don't accept everybody because I kind of want to monitor what's on my LinkedIn timeline. So I always tell people, hey, please send me a note so I can see why you're following me and who you are. Right. And the people that do that, I follow them back. You need to give that simple introduction. And again, it, it shouldn't be you asking for something. It should never start off with you asking for something. Going back to dating, you're not going to reach out to somebody and immediately ask if they just want to have sex, right? It's I rude. I don't know dudes do that. Well, it's rude. They, they, they a lot of them are, are, are taught like stupid things to do that. They'll do that. There are like some women that'll do that. They don't know how to be. Polite. Oh my God, they're lames. Don't be that person. Yeah, that <laughs> that is like it is. But that's the thing, too. That's why I get on to people about your soft skills matter. People like to work with people they like to work with. The person who's the smartest probably didn't always get the job. They probably didn't have good conversations sometimes with the interviewer. They're probably least interested. Mm, they're too awkward. They're yeah. not likable. 
And that's a, that's a big thing. I think jobs nowadays are looking at soft skills more. Um, and then they're looking at um, how you can solve problems. I know that's something that you mentioned. Um, are you a problem solver? And it's not just about telling. Your resume can tell, but your resume can also show. Mm -hmm. And you do that through having what we call qualitative measurables. So numbers, percentages, dollar amounts. It's just showing people, okay, I was able to solve this problem and it was able to have my company make more money. It was able to save money. It was able to make a client happy, things like that. People want to see that on your resume, and they also want to hear that in the interview. I totally agree, and you have to think like that because now technology is actually enabling us to do more with less. So what is going to be the tipping point in your interviews? Because some of the stuff now, they don't really need you maybe to code. We got machine learning, AI. It can help us develop some of the code. We just need you to hopefully be a person on the call who can think things through and come up with a good solution. Yeah, Use cases, do your own research, come back and give us some stuff because everybody's busy doing a million one thing, things. I'm telling you, companies are actually getting a little leaner now, so they're going to need you to be able to have more value besides maybe the one role you do. Yeah, people need to start thinking about their value. What can they add to a company? If you don't know that, now is the time to start thinking about that. You know, am I really valuable or am I just like everybody else? You know, you don't want to get lost in the sauce. This video will be sponsored by Level of Careers. It has a 14-day money-back guarantee. It's a week self-paced course. The four-year reimbursement and counts for continuing ed education. Here are some of the reasons why you can choose cybersecurity, high demand, job security, competitive salary, work variety, and fulfilling work. The national average salary of an information security analyst is of $113,000. Your instructor is Josh Matacor, and here is the brief overview of the course. Theory introduction, security refresher, security frameworks, security regulations and standards, security operations symbols. Then you have these great labs with Azure, Lockheed and Mundry, Microsoft Signal, Secure Cloud Configuration, and they help you with job hunt and job hunt execution. Use my code to try out level careers. You'll get 10% off by using my code and you'll be taking the next step in propelling your career to new height. Now back to our schedule program. Right, and so here is another one that I posted on Twitter, and you're probably familiar with this guy, but he got ran off Twitter. Oh, gosh. Because people people were trying to defend him. I made a link. People I made a, will run you off Twitter for sure. They ain't, I'm standing on business. You ain't going to run me off Twitter. <laughs> Anything I say, I stand 10 toes mm -hmm. down behind. But this person, this I know people are fickle. He don't stand 10 toes behind this. And also, people were trying to defend him on the, my YouTube video of this because I posted this on YouTube and I think my TikTok. And I was just like, I don't care what y'all are saying. This dude got ran off of here, and I couldn't stitch or do it this video for a reason because he don't want nobody to come back him. <laughs> but here it is. Only 500,000 people in the world have their CompTIA Network Plus. Only 500,000 people in the world have their CompTIA Security Plus. But not everybody who gets a Network Plus also has a Security Plus. The total number of people in the world right now who have their Network Plus and their Security Plus is probably closer to 50,000. But consider that we have over 750,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs in the U.S. alone. Over 3 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs worldwide. So if you get your Network Plus and your Security Plus, you're in a good position to start your career in cybersecurity. You add in getting other certifications for minor skills like AZ900 and Splunk Core, and then learn hard skills like Linux, Python, and traffic analysis, make an e-portfolio and a one-page resume, and all of a sudden you're at the top 1% of applicants without experience. If it was so easy, then everybody would do it. But most people are not determined enough to buckle down for 90 days and get it done. If you're one of those few that can see the vision for how you can start your cybersecurity career, it can and should be done in 90 days. I did it. A whole bunch of my students have done it. It's about 300 hours of hard study every day for 90 days. It's happened before and it'll happen again. So, number one, and he forgot to leave out some of the other stuff he used to say on Twitter. He would tell people, oh, yeah, makeup, you got a degree. They're not going to check it. Apply to a thousand roles. Oh, gosh, that reminds me of somebody else about making your um, fake degree on uh, Canva. Canva. You talking about the girl, the PMP? Mm -hmm. Look, her. Mm -hmm. yeah, I got her muted. She follows me, but I got her. Uh, she follows you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny? Before the whole fake PMP thing, I actually messaged her. I said, yo, I don't agree with what you say, but I'd love to have you on the show. She didn't respond. Wow. Yeah. She would be great to have on a podcast. I want to get people that I honestly disagree with Absolutely. on the show. Like, 
Because if you can convince me, you should be all right. But if you can't convince me, then I think that's the issue. People know they ain't going to be able to convince me. Yeah, because a lot of these people have been able to convince a lot of people. And, I mean, even at Thanksgiving, I ran into this girl who was getting her Network Plus, And she's like, yeah, I'm not sure. Should I really even be getting my Network Plus? Because I was told I need my Network Plus before I get my Security Plus. So that reminds me of this. Yeah, I say it's to each his own. Like, I told people, this is why I'm not high on certifications. Now, granted, I tell people, if you want to get a government role, get your certifications, they meet a certain they, level. They and need those certifications and education a lot of the times to go work into those government And they're interviewing. But I heard they're actually finna start getting rid of some of that stuff. Are they? Yeah, one of my friends that's a prior military, well, he, come, he I currently works for Lockheed. He was telling me how they're finna do this new initiative where that's finna go away. But... Back in 2013, I studied for, I read the book in like a week or two, a real thick book, and by July, I had my SEC Plus. No previous security experience. I had took like a forensics class one a quarter, but I didn't, I wasn't ready to work nowhere. Right. So, that, and mind you, that was what, two months, June, July. And all I had at the time, I was working retail at Target. So, the video on here is selling you two to three hours a day. You can do all these things when people have kids, people work full-time jobs. That's a lot of information to digest to possibly get you nowhere. Because there's no way possible you're going to retain all the information. That's similar to like uh, a nine weeks. Unless you're a genius. Right. Unless you're Mike Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike Ross. Or this girl, I've been watching this new show on Netflix called uh, Night Action. Or the night agent. The night agent. Oh, yeah, I watched Night Agent. That was good. And I didn't know the chick had a cybersecurity company. And she really got good. killed by uh, Insider Threat from whoever. I haven't got far. I'm like on episode two. But I was uh, telling my girls more. I was like, yeah, the show interests me because that's what we deal with. We're looking for like Insider Threats. Right. No, and it's a really like good that. show. But needless to say, it's no way possible you're going to digest Splunk. What is it? Security. Supposedly networking. Get some type of uh, Linux skills and all these other stuff. Make an e What are you going to be doing on the e-portfolio? So he was throwing too much out there. Yeah. Um, and it is truly based on the individual. You know, we always say that. I mean, right. I get that these people, they, you know, they have a certain amount of time in their TikToks or whatever to be able to um, appeal to the masses. So they say whatever. But just because that individual is saying that and they may have 100,000 followers, I don't know how many he has, doesn't mean that it's right information. It truly is dependent on what you want to do. I find a lot of my clients come to me and they have zero clue about the role that even interests them. It's just, it's almost like, oh, I want to be in cybersecurity. Why? Why? And oh, I want to be a cybersecurity analyst. Okay, a cybersecurity analyst doing what? Because there could be many different cybersecurity Right, analysts. and they don't even know. I because break they it down just saw them. somebody on social media that makes 160000 a year as a cybersecurity analyst, and that's what they want to be. Right, and then that's when I say, okay, why you want to do it? Okay, what do you currently do? Well, why not go do this in cybersecurity versus this? I like your skill set. I said, fits more project management, product management. Do, go do that. You can do that. You can go be a technical product manager in cybersecurity. Why are you going to go waste all this time and, and try to learn how to code and do this, learn how to do forensics? You ain't got that time. The, the Uber the, driver, she was like, you have to know how to code to be in tech, right? I said, no. <laughs> there's non-technical roles and there's technical roles. And even the technical roles don't all require coding. Right. So people have this misconception. And it's now, don't get me wrong, it's helpful if you know how to do it. Absolutely. Um, but that's not how you, you can learn that as, if you get a job. Like, I'm all for, hey. Lower barrier to entry, let's just get us a job. Let's network. Let's get some skills. Let's get the company to pay for our certifications and level up that way versus you trying to do a whole bunch of stuff. In a short period of time. And then what I run into with clients, and we just start talking about stuff gripes we have with clients, is some of them don't listen. They're not they want to do their own thing. They're not coachable. Literally, they'll come to you and say, I want to be in a new job in two months, and then they don't want to put the effort to get there. And, you know, I think that's something that I was speaking with you about um, very um, shortly, but I was saying how um, a lot of people, you know, it's really important to give assessments. And I know that you do assessments as well. It's important to assess your clients. Like I have a lot of my clients come in and I really need to understand their personal lives. If I don't understand their personal lives, 
it's going to be a problem later on down the road Mm -hmm. because their personal is always going to end up trickling into their professional and the work that we do together. You know, they may not have a lot of time that they make you want to believe that they have, or they may have some other things going on that could have, that could ultimately affect their timeline that they have in mind. And it's not realistic. It's really important to sit with your clients and to assess them and know what truly it is that they want and to make sure that you set expectations. Definitely. And that's why sometimes I ask my clients, yo, you married, you got a kid, you got a family that's keeping you in the city. Because now we're not seeing as many remote positions. We're not. And so I'm like, your location may be directly impacting you finding a job. And so I'm telling them, yo, you might have to move. Or if I'm if I'm telling you, hey, we need to apply to some jobs. Like you cannot be successful if you're not applying to jobs. Or I, one of my pet peeves is if I make your resume and then I look at it again and you've changed stuff that I did for you for a oh reason. Oh my gosh! And you don't even tell us that you changed something. Yeah, I was like, I didn't put that on there. Like, and then you're you putting it? it out there, and then you're like, oh, I'm not. Nothing's happening. Well, it could be because you changed something and you didn't tell us that you changed it. Yeah, and, doing, and then I'm asking him, hey, what have you been working on? I have a new client. Like, every other day he's sending me something. I get it. He want to be in cyber. But I'm like, bro, whatever you're working on, like, your current skills don't fit that. So I was like, yes, do I think you could do it? But you hadn't shown us anything on paper that you worked on that show us you would be a good fit for that. So I'm like, let's just stick. Like, I've been telling him, let's just stick. Learn about identity and access management right now. You kind of do some of that stuff now. Let's get a little bit better at it. Let's do some stuff. Or... <laughs> but they have to stick to it. I feel like a lot of the clients, they're in a hurry. They're trying to go nowhere fast. That's what's going to happen because they're trying to keep up with the Benjamins. Yeah, They want what they're seeing on social media, and they're not willing to, like you said, put in the work to get there. Right. and then I, But I will say I have the benefit of having realistic clients. I do talk to them. I was like, yo, one guy was looking at some role. I was just like, well, you need to. If we do take a role, like, I don't want it to not be a role where you can't take care of your family. So we want to oh, make yeah. sure if we can at least do it lateral. But I, I'm just honest with them. Like, I, I have them all record their interviews so I can listen to them. And I dissect them. Hey, you said um, you did a lot of filler words. I was like, just slow down. If you don't know something, just tell me you don't know, but you'll be able to find out the answer. Like, most of us Google every day. Every day. And we can find out answers. Absolutely. And also, you know, you can, I mean, depending on how you are able to, um, do your interviews, you're able to, I mean, still, in a sense, be Googling if you're in the interview. I mean, but again, that's that depends on how fast you work and how your brain <laughs> operates, yeah. right? Because not everybody can do that. So not everybody's well, a finesser. Yeah, or you just ask, just clarifying questions of what that mean or what is that. Sometimes you may recognize something as something else and they're saying it a different way. You don't exactly. understand Exactly. There's been times when I'll say, actually... I don't have the answer for you right now, but I'm pretty sure as we continue on in this interview, I'll have it for you in about 10 minutes. And then I end up circling back around. Then I answer the question. I did that. I did. Okay. This was a good question. They asked me an interview. You know what? I'm going to make sure I knock that question out. And so now if they ask me in another interview, I'm going to knock it out. That's why my goal is to get you to keep on interviewing because we're just going to build, build, build. Exactly. Don't be afraid to take the interview. And even so, if you can't answer a question in your interview, you can always follow up. By the way, it's always important to follow up after an interview anyways. You should be making sure that you send those thank you emails. Um, And in your thank you email, you can say, hey, I remember you asked this question during the interview. And unfortunately, you know, I was so rattled. I wasn't able to give you a response. What I meant to say is, and then say what you were supposed to say in that interview. They'll respect you more and they'll remember you because a lot of people are not sending follow-up emails. Yeah, I say sometimes it's like hit or miss. I think sometimes on the, the company, some companies say, hey, like, sending us a thank you really don't matter because we ain't looking at that. So I would say it depends. Some companies like it. I have a, a thank you letter template that I've used. As, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's helped me because I used to, what I'll do, it's a cheat code. Record your interview, listen back to it, take the notes, draw up your thank you letter, and then gear it towards that person. And that's yeah. the way you can, you can do that. A lot of people don't do that. It's like, I promise one of the simplest tricks. Like my stuff is, it's simple. Like, I'm a boxing fan. Shout out to Devin Haney. I told y'all Devin Haney was going to beat Regis Pro Grade because he was overrated and the new. But <laughs> when you just keep it simple and go back to the basis and the foundations of everything, you're going to always be a good interviewer or a good employee. If you, When you're trying to get too cute and too fancy, that's when you start messing up. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you, or you're thinking about other things that people have told you instead of just sticking 
to the game plan. I always say interviewing is like marketing. And I really wish that they taught this in school, just like they taught finance, right? We, we really wish that they taught those things as cores. But um, you have to be a salesperson for yourself. You have to market yourself, you know, and you really need to practice. That's the only way to get better at interviewing. And I think it also comes down to knowing yourself. There's those individuals that always land the job, why? Because they know themselves, they're confident, and they're able to speak their truth, and they're able to translate that in something that makes sense to an interviewer. A lot of people get into interviews, and they think, oh, I'm being interviewed, and it's just me being interviewed. You interview no, them. you need to interview them. You sh- It's not just about having those questions prepared, but you need to be having a conversation as the interview is going on, like you're talking to your friend. That's how you need to look at it. Stop thinking that these interviewers are so superior. It's like when people think that celebrities are so superior. They're humans just like you. They bleed the same way as you. They just got more money. They die the same way as you. They just have more money or the interviewer is just in a higher position. But trust me, interviewers have to interview at some point too, right? So always remember that it needs to be a two-way street. Have a conversation with your interviewer and trust me, it will change how your interviewing process goes. For sure. And one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking, and I'm trying to think if it's going to come back to me, it was about clients. And I was thinking, was it, I don't know if it was about them being successful, interviewing. It was something I thought about. It was about being coachable, teachable, no. Kind of. It was something else. And it probably come back to me as, come as, back. as we talk, but I think, like you said, I've had clients where, like, so a lot of times I we'll work together like exclusively like three months, but I'm still helping them throughout whatever they go through. Right. And so some, I tell them like straight up, like, hey, this ain't gonna be easy. I got people that's got all different type of backgrounds. That's doing this, like people that are more technical, people are not people that's coming from a different background, but they worked on like a lot of good projects. And mm-hmm. I was like, you can do this. You're just gonna have to keep interviewing. And get better. And eventually, I think you'll land that one. But some people think they can just interview for three. Like, they put their resume out there. It's been three weeks. Why am I getting rejections? Why am I not getting jobs? On average, the last time I checked, it takes at least three months for somebody to land a new role. And that also means they are very, very, very aggressive with their applying. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about submitting five applications a day. I'm not talking about submitting ten applications a day. I'm talking about these people go over the top to get their applications yeah. out there. Yeah. That's why I tell people, hey, look, go find a recruiter, send them the scripts that I gave you in a note. And if they accept you, the next day follow up, tell them what role you applied to, give them the requisition number. And if they reply, they may say, okay, hey, let's set up a, an interview. Like, I, matter of fact, mm-hmm. I applied to a gig. I did the screening, but when I found out, because the gig didn't have the, um, the salary on there. So I was like, oh, no, that's too low. So I knew friends in my network that probably that worked for them. And I had them all apply. And I reached out to the recruiter and she didn't say nothing back. I said, well, here's her email. And this is a tip. Most of the time you might not reach that recruiter on LinkedIn, but if you got the email, most of the time they're going to see it. Mm-hmm. And so now most of everybody who I gave the email to, they got a screening coming up. See? And so also working with me is not just me helping you, but now you're submersed into my network. People reach out to me all the time. Hey, do you know anybody be a good fit? So a friend of mine, they have like an associate or junior security analyst role coming open, and he hit me up. Yeah, you got anybody that's good for this? And I did. And they talked, and he said, yeah, I think he'll be a good fit. It's like one of my current clients is pretty much an active fireman, but he has a cyber, he has his master's in cybersecurity. He's interned at a SOC and did some other stuff, so he's just trying to make a transition. And I was like, dude, we, we're going to get there. You just got to keep on keeping on in the fight. Like you're coming from a different background, but the background that you have is really in line with what you'd be doing. Mm -hmm. Cause you do incident response in the real world. You're going to burning buildings and you guys got protocols on how you get these people out. Or if you're an EMT, you do all these different things and you recognize what to do for this patient and that patient. That's how I always explain incident response to people. I say, Hey, it's like being a cop fireman and a detective and paramedic all at once. Mm -hmm. Like but it's just on a network, but it's different things that you do being an IR. And if you can do that, that's the good part. A lot of people aren't slowing down and kind of trying to understand the job function. 
Right. They're still looking at it from their level and not the level that they'd be interviewing at. And that's one of the bigger issues. And so when I explain it to a client, because as he's seen one of my posts, that post I made about like, here's why I support people are struggling in their interviews. He was like, hey, this sound like me. It was about him. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, hey, it was at a high level to make good content for everybody. And I was telling him, I was like, hey, like, look at, instead of somebody asking you about multi-factor authentication and how you feel about it on the end user support side, look at it from a security compliance control side about why you need it or the benefits of that. Like, Okta just recently got breached not too long ago, and I was reading a blog about Cloudflare and how they actually pretty much uh, averted, like, going through a big incident. And they had a lot of their privileged access accounts connected to a hardware token key versus having it, like, virtual where somebody can do the prompt. I hate that. Like, that happened to me the other day on my personal Microsoft account. I got a prompt I didn't recognize. I was like, I ain't enter my password nowhere. How am I getting a prompt? And I seen the login activity from somewhere that I didn't recognize, so I just immediately reset my password. But on the end of you want being a security, if this was like an enterprise account, I could say, hey, automatically block logins that we have never seen log in from that place in 90 days. And then we'll send you some, hey, is this you trying to log on? Right. You can do things like that. Those type of policies can help you. But for one, they don't know that because they haven't been introduced to it. So it takes a person, a mentor or someone can tell them kind of the things that you can speak or how you can impress somebody. So. That's where I come in. It's like I'll take things that I, we do at work, uh, relay it to them, and I'll show them some stuff so they can say, okay, you need to say this to impress them. Nobody else is going to say this because they don't know this. Right, and sometimes people think that they can do it on their own. And, I mean, that's fine. I mean, see how far it gets you, mm-hmm. right? But if it's not getting you anywhere and you've been doing it for a while, it's probably time to invest in a mentor, invest in a um, coach to help you through. Definitely, definitely. And so also what I want to get on real quick is I want to talk about You Deserve IT. And I just want to talk about briefly kind of the services you offer and kind of what's your steps for if people want to, you know, after this interview, kind of get with you and and learn what you know and and be helpful that way. Yeah, absolutely. So You Deserve IT Consulting or You Deserve It kind of interchangeable. Um, It is a career services firm. So we do focus on helping people navigate the job market. So it's not just for those looking to transition into a different field or specifically transition into tech. We have a lot of clients from different backgrounds. So whether you want to level up, you want more money, you need help with negotiation, you need help for, you know, creating a roadmap and being able to um, land the role that you want six months from now, and you want to be proactive, we're here to assist with that. Some of the services we offer, the main one's going to be career coaching, um, resume revamp. So how that works essentially is we do one-on-one walkthroughs with individuals, um, reviewing their resumes and telling them, you know, where they can, um, definitely, uh, make it better. Right. We also do interview preparation, LinkedIn optimization. Um, and then, uh, we also do, um, help with, as I mentioned, negotiation, thank you, um, emails, things like that. So those are just, you know, an idea of the services that are being offered. Um, for the most part, the career coaching is like the most sold service. So there is a month to month option. And then there's also a three month program that you can opt into. Just depends on if you want a longer commitment or if you kind of want something that's on the flexible side. Um, If you are looking to get in contact with us, you can definitely um, head on over to our website, which is www.u, as in the letter U, deserve itconsulting.com. And um, there's a schedule now and we do offer free 30 minute consultations if you have um, no idea of kind of what is going to um, be the best route for you. Nice. I always like the possibly do a consult with first of my purchase coaching for me because if you come to me and you don't have any skills then it's just like okay I'm gonna try but listen you're gonna have to do a whole bunch of stuff to to get a gig right it's important to be able to almost have that interview to see if you, that person's a great fit for your coaching services so you're not meant to like as a coach like and as a therapist and everything you're not meant to take every single client that comes your way mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you can send them in a different direction to somebody better who can assist them. 
Um, and that's great, you know. So it's really important to be able to have those consultations to be able to um, determine if you can help them or not. Yeah, I agree. I send people other places all the time just like, hey, I'm not the best with those roles. I'm going to send you to this person because that's what they do. Um, if the people out there are watching, what do you think, and you probably already have this down in your pitch deck because I just know you do. What pitch is <laughs> what is like the, the average salary increase you've had like for your clients? Average? Whew, I'd say the average is probably – around 45,000, 50,000. Um, that's generally has been the average increase. Um, some clients have been truly blessed to make a lot more, but I'd say around 45, 50,000 is the average. Right. Yeah. I haven't like quantified everything. So I just threw a number. I said 2025, 20, but I also say it just depends. Like one guy coming in on my TikTok, he was like, man, how do I get the, the 80,000 jobs roles? And I was like, hey, I'm a, you ain't gonna like this answer, but I'm gonna tell you, pimp. <laughs> just apply. <laughs> just, just apply, apply. apply. <laughs> just apply to the role. That's all you got to do. You just never know. Um, you know, you'll hear sometimes people say, don't apply to the role if you don't match at least 70 to 80% of the criteria that's on the job post. And I get why people say that, but I've, I've gotten roles where I did not meet even half of the requirements. And I know I tend to get roles because of my personality. And that's a, that's a one thing I want to talk about, personality hires. I, I mean, if you want to go in a different direction, we could talk about that later. But people talk about personality hires. And I think it's really important when you're building a team to have people that do have great personalities, people that have great um, leadership skills, people who are able to problem solve, people who may not be so technical, but they can work well within a team and keep a team moving in the right direction. It's not always about having a skill set. And I think people forget that. Some people don't have personalities, which is why, you know, what you were saying, just because you're smart and you may have, you know, what the company's looking for, sometimes you're not getting hired because you're just boring. You know, you could just be smart and be good at what you do, but what do you have to offer outside of that? People need to be in, be able to interact with you. People need to be able to talk to you and to trust you, and you need to be likable. I can tell you get on the calls. So I'm like, okay, I have a hard stop at 4 p.m. <laughs> For what, my clients? Anybody. Or anybody, <laughs> yeah, like in my interviews and stuff like that? No, I, can, I don't say that. I don't know where this term. I have never heard it until people brought it to TikTok. I was like, it's this uh, black lady. What's her name? Like, I don't know what her name is, but she, like, pretty much – acts like like the white women that are like the project managers uh -huh. and how she's talking on the meetings and stuff. It's like hilarious to me. I was like, this is crazy. Oh my gosh. So I, I'm not a fan of meetings. Like I think people even at my jobs know I'm not a fan of meetings. Like I, I hate that. Um, I've, I've never liked being in meetings. If we can literally just have a conversation via email Please save us time. That's one thing I get compliments about. You know, at work, manage, my manager will say, um, Markeisha, somebody came to me and said that you do not, like, in meetings, you don't waste any time. If a meeting needs to end in 5, 10 minutes, you're wrapping it up, and that's that. I pride myself on that. There's no need to waste time. And whatever else you have to say, you can say it in an email. Trust Listen, me. I, I, I'm mad we didn't got we don't have circles no more on Twitter. But, I know. But read this. This is this is funny. This was told to me. This is this is a, my manager saying something to me or whatever. You only got to read it out loud, but I was just talking about it because it's hilarious. What? No, exactly. I do not put my camera on either. I know my manager hates me for that, but you know what? I mean, I'm going to come on camera maybe four times a year, and I think that's good enough, right? I think so. For me, those people have met me in person. They know I'm approachable. Yeah, just, exactly. They want me to put my face on camera for a meeting that's sometimes two to three minutes. For people that are about to get off shift, like, it'd be pissing me off. <sighs> that's that micromanagement, white people bullshit. Or people come to meetings dirty. Yeah. Like, they'll be like they'll literally say, oh, my God, I'm so dirty looking. So why are you on camera? Just save us all the idea of looking at you and just get off camera because it's not a requirement. Right. Sometimes I don't be one. Honestly, a lot of times the means we have shouldn't be means. It could have been an email. Exactly. My point. And yeah. I will advocate for that. I will tell people when they're wasting my time. Yes, I yeah. will. I just don't like being on meetings where it's nothing required of me to say anything. 
Now, if it's some, if I say, hey, we got an incident going on, he call you, and then we're going back and forth, right. cool. But if not, I was like, well, what's the point? It, it's it's stupid. It's I don't really care. It's, it's dumb. I've always, I find that out to be like with the older type of people, that are older managers, like they do that. Stuff. Yeah. I'm like, fam, I don't, you don't have to see me. Like, even if we was in office. Especially the woman. I don't you know, ever had I've a, never had bad. I've always had good stuff with women. Because you're a man. And I feel this is the opposite. A it woman is. to a woman, like, they're just nasty. Yeah. Yeah, I think. And I then think a man to a woman, he's like super nice to the woman. Yeah, I think so. I think it's also, I think it depends. It's, it's nuanced. I've seen, well, spe- specifically y'all, because you know how many, like, it's crazy. I don't go to nobody else's podcast where they tell them, you need to bring this guest on, this guest on. If you're about diversity, you bring these people on. I'm like, fam, this is my podcast. You can do what you want. <laughs> right. And I'm like, second of all, you don't know who I'm planning to bring on the pod. <laughs> Like, I have other races that I'm planning to get them to call the pod. But it's like, this is majority my audience. This is the exposure to five years from now, a little girl will see this and say, oh, my gosh, I can go be in cybersecurity. Absolutely. People want to see the value. So whoever so you're going to bring about, on that's valuable, have them. Yeah, that's that's really what it's about. Now, we had a, a, a hot take that's a pretty funny. We were talking about what do the Indian recruiters do with your resumes? Yes. And, like, I don't like immediately you give them a resume. Hey, give me your last four and do all this other stuff. And I'm like, mm, I don't know, fam. Like, why are you pestering me so bad? I don't even know. Like, you, like a lot of times they'll say they're hiring for the company, but I really don't know if they are hiring for the company. They're not hiring for the company. I never hear anything back. No, it's just all a ploy to get your information and to be able to pretty much steal it and just replace it with their information. They want to be able to build their own resumes. Um, I really need people to stop falling for the Indian recruiters. Um, you'll see a lot of them send you an email and the email will have like different fonts and font sizes, right? Like in the immediate, like, you know, don't even apply for that role. And then especially when they're asking for the right to represent or they're asking for you to provide the last four of your social or they're saying, are, you know, are you a U.S. citizen? Like those things, like a regular recruiter is generally not asking that in the immediate. Yeah, they're asking that the when you get in the screening call. And they're never asking for your social the last four. That's only HR. So if a company is asking for the last four of your social, it's a red flag. And I've heard a lot of people fall for it. Yeah, I heard recruiters. So, I, so my guy, Nate Wiley, used to do that type of recruiting back in the day. He was like... He said, man, I'm going to keep it honest with you. Like, back in the day, we had to do that because everybody was, like, kind of having the same clients. But he was telling them, he was like, we probably not going to get a lot of people because people don't want feel comfortable with doing it. He was like, so I totally understand. I also would say that I always say, okay, well, who the, who's the, the project with? Yeah. Do you even have, like, the project in hand? Like, or are you just collecting I resumes w- to be able to do your proposal? And so if they say if they tell you on a call, go to the career site and see if it's on there. Like if it ain't on there, then I was like, okay, cool. And look at the reviews too. You can go on Glassdoor, you can go on Google, and you can see what people are saying about the company. And generally, from experience, especially if it's these Indian recruiters, people are saying this is a scam or this is not legit or they don't really have the contracts, things like that. Yeah, I've never gotten a job from them. It's always like, hey, they'll start getting aggressive with you. Hey, uh, very can you send aggressive. it to me? Man, I, I get to it when I can. So they'll they'll get aggressive. You send it, and you you'll never hear from them again, ever. Because what they're doing is, and never send your resume in Word version, by the way. Always send it in PDF, especially when it comes to formatting and things like that. But um, you can also lock your resume from anybody, well, if you send it a PDF, from anybody being able to copy what's on it. So what they do is if you send your resume via Word, um, they will just change your contact information and put theirs, and then they'll send that off for other jobs and such. And, of course, some of these companies are hiring people in India because it is cheaper. Cheap. Um and I get it. They're starting to outsource to different countries. Um, so that's something to all to also be on the lookout for when right. you're looking for a role. Start thinking about how long is your role going to be available? Is AI going to take over it? Or is somebody else that's 17 an hour going to take over your role? Yeah, that and also it's one of those insider threat things where it was a study that came out a while ago and it was like, People that worked overseas for companies were sending information to their countrymen and, and all their money and other stuff. So they were stealing stuff. So it's like that's kind of like the thing that you run into when you do that, when you can just hire. Like for the life of me, I don't want to talk to people 
when I call customer service that don't speak English. Yeah, I don't either. I was like, why? Like, you can't even understand me. I can't understand you. At all. You. They're working in a call center. You like should talk to 50 your own people, people in the call center. People. I don't know. That's just crazy. And this is just one more, right? We we talked about boot camps. We talked about courses. But what this is why I don't like. And um, J- what's my boy's name? Jamel, Leo Grand Prince. He was talking about on his Twitter, like, I don't like people giving unsolicited advice when you don't have experience in that. Like, your opinion should not matter. There's a, a TikTok that I'm going to play right now where this girl is talking about bees, but she don't know. For one, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And two, she's not even in the industry. You you shouldn't be commenting on that because you don't know what you're talking about. And it's hilarious. And I'm going to I'm gonna play it for you because it's hilarious because we'll probably start wrapping it up. Today I received a cease and desist for hosting my own free GovTech happy hour. about the information, I don't care how I look. All I have to say is people like this, nine times out of ten, if they are selling you on how to make money, nine times out of ten, it is a grift. If you are so much of an expert in this specific field, if you were so skillful in government tech or to the tech industry and you were so good at it, why aren't you in that industry now? Now, I know some of y'all, her fans might say, oh, because she's making more money teaching us. Exactly. That's how she makes her money. That's how she made her money. By teaching other people or selling courses to other people, selling you a dream, essentially. You cannot go uh, uh, apply for corporate America jobs with just a Google certificate alone. It, it won't even stand up, let alone if you get a job interview. A lot of times, these people know exactly who to target. They know that the black community and black people, we are a small minority within these industries for a numerous amount of reasons. But one of those reasons is because a lot of us are, are not simply are not aware. So because we are not aware, that makes us more vulnerable and susceptible to grifters like that. Notice how I'm calling her a grifter and not a scam. And nine times out of ten, it always starts off as a free course, a free guide, or a free seminar. And then while you're there, they sell you on a user experience. So it's probably a nice ball, nice food, whatever it may be. Beautiful ambiance just to upsell you and get you lost into the dream so you can constantly be in a cycle of consumerism. It's not designed for you to go on and to prosper and to make $200,000 plus uh, in that industry. It's so that you can become heavily reliant upon useless information. And if it's not useless, it's simple information you can get on a quick Google search. So please do not be dismayed, my black people. <laughs> like, I'll let you go. What but- are the comments saying? There are people in the comments that are not in the industry they don't know. So, like, I know I come in for a fact and said, you missed the mark on this one. And some dude actually just recently responded to me, told me some, oh, well, you should go buy Andrew Tate's course. And I'm like, I'm going to flame him in a second whenever I get a chance. But I was like, she don't know what she's talking about. Right. Because it's not that situation. That's why I don't under- – she was actually clout station because all the hashtags – Well, it ha- wasn't even relevant to what was what Bees was talking about. Right. Bees was talking about a cease and desist from, I guess, if – People don't know from um, what is it? I think Black, Black Dove Dove Tech, Tech. Um, sending her a cease and desist. Um, and so for that individual to use that as a stitch, it's definitely to clout chase because she knows that it's almost a controversy right now. And so she knows that more people are going to be searching that and she's going to get a lot more followers, perhaps. Right. And, and let's do this because people love to use words loosely, but they be loud and wrong. Definition of grift, to obtain money or property illicitly as in confidence gain, to acquire money, property, illicitly. That's all it says. Let's go with the grifter. <laughs> really? I just clicked on grifter. It's a lot of hate out there. It's the same thing. Is that's not what grifting is. Grifting is what your girl Pearl used to do. Taking all black people, especially black men, talking points and going to repurpose them on her pro, uh, pro, uh, platform like they're hers. That's grifting. Cause that's how she was getting paid. She didn't know what she was talking about. Every time you would get down to it, she didn't know what she's talking about. What Bees was doing is not. Like she had been doing her thing for a while with her Discord, telling people what they need to do, getting on the game on how she used to work overseas. So that's why I was like, when She's you, literally telling people her experience. Right. And if people want to know more, then, and again, I don't know if 
B sells courses? I don't. She so I have. It's actually helped me out. She had. She did this like it's not financial advice, but she did put out this book, Financial Starter Kit, and it was also a course that she did. But that actually was like a helpful course. Yeah, if people want to learn more, then they can go buy to learn more. Like that's that's business. Yeah, I don't care who you are. I'm about to put my coaching as a course because I just don't have time to coach like a lot to of continue clients. doing it. It's yeah. A, it's a lot. The group coaching is kind of where I'm headed now. Um, if you're going to want one-on-one that is going to start being a, yeah, a, I, I, a higher price is just because it's very time consuming and I'm kind of moving into the realm of, um, needing more of my time to be able to put things like this program together for you all. So did I send you that, that podcast episode with Byron, uh, Gordon, I don't know. No. Okay. I'll send it to you. But he was talking about how his coaching and how it used to be, I think like, uh, what, what was it like? 2000, something like an hour. And so where one time a client just paid him 40,000 for eight hours. He was like, man, I need to go up. I don't need somebody to be able to be able to pay for like my whole day with $40,000. Right. And so he went up and, uh, he it was just a lot of free gaming. And so if I didn't send it to you, I'll send oh, it yeah, to you. Oh yeah, definitely send that to me. I Cause it was good. It. But no, it's a thing like, it's not a grift because most of us have something you don't, the knowledge and experience. Everybody else do something. You'll be surprised when people are paying money for business coaches, how to get in certain rooms. Oh, my gosh. Especially when you're up there. Like, a lot of these executive people are paying so much money to other coaches yes. just to be able to level up. So That coach I was telling you about, he, like, he charges a lot. But you get game because it's like exactly this knowledge isn't Google. Like, the way that I do things, it's not going to just tell you, hey, if you go – Oh, how do I land a role? It's going to give you a whole bunch of stuff, but it's not going to be actionable. Not like the way I do it, not the way I'm showing you that I did it. So that's why you can't just be simple and Googleable. But I don't like that because it's clout chasing, number one. Number two, she's not even in the industry, so she doesn't know what she's talking about. Right. Because if she did her research, she would see, oh, she made a bulk of her money working overseas and making investments. Right. And now most of her money is coming from actually just working with brands. Like, she's getting some money from other stuff, but it's not. it's not like she's seeing – Hey, go do this and that. Like she actually advocates for people just to get GovTech roles, not necessarily just like a cybersecurity, but just getting a role in GovTech mm-hmm. because if you can have a feeder role, you got a better chance of getting a cyber, which I've been telling some people now too. Like, hey, now a lot of y'all going to do like feeder roles first. Like if you're trying to do something technical, because it's going to be harder to get in now. A lot of people were it burned over the pandemic. Harder. A lot of people don't put in the work. Like I said, we talking about my, I, I bring day spring up on the pod like once every month. But I was like, I tell my clients all the time, if you ain't trying to put that work in like day, if you go from 2020 to what he's doing now, he just made his announcement about leaving Datadog, like you're not going to be at that level. And that's when I say you got to have elite skills to get to a level like his, and that comes with studying. It does. A lot of y'all not doing that. A lot of y'all do, and I'm not, I ain't following y'all for one that had a nice car, had a nice girl on your arm, the nice shoes you want to flex, you know, had a, a linen shirt unbuttoned with your chest showing. I ain't mad at it. But you got to put in the work. But as we said, you have to continue studying and you need to always be growing that skill set. And it's really important to focus on what interests you the most. I feel like a lot of people, too, they're they're wanting to get into tech, but nothing is of a passion to them. And I guess it's fine. I mean, sometimes you can grow into your passion, right? You can discover that at a later time, but you need to find a niche that makes sense and you need to. Like, if Splunk is your thing, study Splunk, and that's it. Yeah. Don't study anything else but Splunk so you yeah. can become the SME, the expert, and then right. you can make money like that. Right, yeah, and if you study Splunk or any other type of sim, nine times out of ten, you may have to study, like, operating systems and some type of networking concepts because it's if you're going to be, like, an architect or infrastructure person for that, you'll need to know that part, but that's related to what you want to do. I've made two couple of videos about quitting jobs. B just recently made one about quitting her job. You know, when people see, like, the – amount of money like you quit for they just like oh, i would have stayed but they don't understand how it feels to be miserable doing a job you don't want to do right and that's what i tell people okay cool you can get in for the money but eventually you just go through the motions you're gonna be just like the adults we ran into when we were younger because they hated their job and yeah, i'd rather my- you find a tech role you like yep that pays you what you want versus doing something you don't like and being miserable Exactly, exactly. And I always, you know, I'm starting to work with clients on um, exit strategies. So that's coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. You know, what does an exit strategy look like for people that's making all this money? Are you investing that money? Like what's next? Because if you're working, let's just say all of these jobs, that's not sustainable the rest of your life. Yeah. You could do it for one year, two years, three years, maybe four years. 
but you're going to eventually get burnt out. You need yeah. to take that money, you need to invest it, and you need to grow it like the people that are in those higher up positions. Right. And even if you like, this ain't a financial advice, but if you get like either a, a trading account or like a Roth, you can just put it in a fund that's known to perform well over 10 years, like all the time. And you don't even have to worry about actually trading and you're going to see your money go up. Yeah. Like it's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do. You can buy companies that are already working, you name it. But I really feel like we got to give y'all like a part two because of how the day I started think so too. and we'll figure out maybe the next time we'll be in DC, you know, the new scenery and, and really get out there and do it. But I want to ask Markeisha if she wants to leave you guys with anything uh, for this episode. Yeah, sure. So once again, I'm so happy that you invited me to be on here and I'm happy that I ended up coming in person. Um, if you all want to learn more about the career services that I offer, the Achieve It Pathways program that has pre-launched since Friday, if you want to learn more about the next things I have coming up, please reach out to me. Once again, you can reach out to me at www.u-deserveitconsulting.com. You can also text me or call me at 505 585 Four one nine four. I almost forgot the number. Or you can send an email at hello at you letter u deserve it consulting dot com. Um, best ways to find me. Also, I am on Twitter. So my Twitter is underscore m as in Mary, s as in Sam, t as in Tom, r as in Robert, d as in dog, o as in octopus, m as in Mary, um, which actually stands for master dumb because people always want to know. What does my handle stand for? It's masterdom, which means ruler of all things. So, yes. Um, but if there's anything else I want to leave you all with, I was just telling my Uber driver, she said, what's the best advice you've ever been given? And I said, the best advice I've ever been given is that you cannot be successful on your own. You need to collaborate with other people and you need to partner with other people. And sometimes I get that you want to do it on your own because you feel that you know the best way to go about it. But there's people that are smarter than you and there's people that you can learn from. And if you look around and you see people that are in higher places like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all of those individuals, right? They didn't do it alone. They were doing it with other people, people that they could bounce ideas off of. So if that's one thing I want to leave you with, it's look around in your circle. And if you can't collaborate with the people that are around you, then you need to surround yourself with better people. You need to surround yourself with people that are actually going to motivate you and to pour into you and get you to where you want to get to because life is too short to be wasting it on people that are going nowhere. Um, so yeah. Cool. And it was funny when you was giving your number, I thought you was going to give him the Mike Jones number, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just been another episode of the Texas talk podcast. I really got really hope you guys enjoyed it. Also, this will be up early on the Patreon. So make sure you subscribe to the Patreon Salute to the channel. You need a consultation. The links will be in the description. All her links will be in the description. And until next time, let's stay textual and we out. Peace.